a little action. <laughs> I got nothing. Yeah. <laughs> See, I, I'm thinking maybe like I need that when I walk out of my shower every morning. <laughs> Smoke coming, a little fireworks. Speaking of showers, how many people are staying here in this hotel? Okay, like I woke up in the middle of the night in the nightmare that I was in my bed and the shower was on my face because the shower is in the bedroom. <laughs> There's a curtain. And there is a curtain, but I, you know, I am a little voyeuristic in nature. So I do have to admit, I was, I, I'm, I'm in there and I'm thinking, housekeeping. <laughs> I'm not going to say a word. <laughs> No, no. <laughs> no, one thing I don't like, though, <coughs> is service. they have... <laughs> room service! They have the, the pumps that fill, they refill for the shampoo and the... Okay, I'm Sicilian from New Jersey. <laughs> My grandmother taught me, you take everything that's not tied down. <laughs> like, <laughs> if, we're, if, <laughs> if we're at a wedding, 300 people, and there's a centerpiece... She will take every centerpiece at the wedding. She will juggle them out so they're in the air because she can't carry them. So I have more shampoo conditioners and shower caps and my drawers at home that my wife thinks I'm absolutely insane. So I don't like those refillable pumps. I have enough shower caps. I can make a parachute and jump out of the plane on the way back to Maryland. All right, so I want you to laugh a little. I want you to be awake a lot. They took the coffee away. I'm following all these crazies. Like they said this morning, you got to be a little crazy. Well, this stage is full of crazy. We're yeah. making a difference. Man, you guys, and I say it every time I speak, I am so proud of you and happy to be on the mission that you're on because you, you have to change healthcare. There's really no answer to anything besides that structure changing. And you're in the front of this front lines all the time and you're gathering your troops and I talk about fighting this opioid crisis and in the beginning I, I used to get upset because I fought hard I'm losing sleep I'm in the trenches it's five years in the making and I turn around and there's nobody there and because of you too I don't even turn around anymore because I feel I can feel the swelling behind me of people that are gonna fight the fight to make a difference so thank all of you too because one thing you have to realize if you want to make a difference don't worry you are because out of all the people, now it's up to 150 people a day dying. It's 1,000 people a week we lose to overdose. 1,000 people a week. But guess what? They're not any of your patients. You're saving lives every day for what you're doing, and you don't even realize how it's happening. So imagine a world without opioid overdoses. I imagine it every day because I'm just sweating bullets over the, the statistics, so I'm going to fire hose you with statistics. Oh, Angela and Amy, how are you? It's so good to see you. One of my partners in crime, emergency room medicine doctor that is, how many hospitals do you have under your belt now? 220, Whoa. 220 emergency rooms and is sick and tired of the stuff that you're going to see on here as well. In fact, he's here for an integrative medicine conference to learn about integrative medicine, not the business side of it and some of the this, but actually to understand what it's like because he has a more holistic plan in his head because he's not happy with the status quo as well. So thank you guys for being here. Happenstance. And his beautiful wife, who happened to start an organic farming business, is the, that you're going to wrap that right into this holistic medicine because food is medicine. Um, okay. So I'm going to fire hose you with statistics, right? So let's talk about a day. Today. You woke up today, right? Right. We're not done with the day yet. You're going to go to sleep tonight. Guess what happens in that 24-hour period? 650 prescriptions for opioids are written. 4,000 start non-medical use. 600 start heroin use. 3,300 visits to the ER. 90 babies are born addicted. 140 people, now it's 150 people. And 60 are related to fentanyl because that's the new illicit drug that's showing up everywhere. Mm. A day. 90 babies, a day. 
Have you ever heard a baby that's born addicted to opioids? There's a scream that they, they have, I'm sure you guys know, that noise, that, that defin, deafening scream of the withdrawals from that, the day that they're born. These statistics are obviously grave. Now, a system, it may be too small for you to see, but almost on purpose, because we're, there, we're, we have a system that was put in place that we trust. So we have health care, we have government, we have pharmaceutical companies to make these magical pills. We have the doctors who then prescribe those, and we're trusting that this beautiful system that was put together that's failing miserably was supposed to protect us. But if you look at a timeline in 1995 to now, you have FDA-approved opioids for broader use, broader base bog off a bogus study. Purdue introduces OxyContin. Pain is the fifth vital sign. It launched $206 million marketing campaign. FDA examiner goes to work for Purdue. So let's just start at the early sots of this. A 38-person study that was conducted in a hospital setting of people who received opioids and didn't become addicted became the source to say that these are not addictive drugs. Now, the Sackler family, who we've all heard about, which is Purdue, these guys started, that family started in the turn of, in the, turn of the century, in the early 1900s. They came from Europe. They were, uh, they were Jewish at the time. They applied for medical school. They wanted to go into psychiatry, and they, it was a quota thing, so they weren't accepted, went back to Europe, got their degrees, came back, left one brother there, and the other two started psychiatry businesses in the States. The one that stayed over there started working in this marketing thing with a, a, like a little lancet or a magazine that went to medical doctor's offices, and they started putting ads in there for certain drugs, and his, his light bulb went off. So they came over to the United States and did it. One of the first ones he did to promote was Valium. Valium was not made for the things that he then put in this magazine. There was no control. There was no FDA. Nobody was saying a word. They just put this stuff out to the doctor's offices as mama's little helper. In fact, isn't that a <coughs> Rolling Stones yeah. song? Yeah. That's what they were singing about. Because in the 60s through the 70s, it was like 68% of all women had Valium in their medicine cabinets. Mm -hmm. Wow, holy crap. Just if you were a little stressed out. That was the Sackler family. That's how it originated, because they found out that there's this wheel that they can turn and get people just say anything you want. It works. Then the FDA comes in. They start to put some restrictions on some things. And then it's, they, they still advertise, the, and now we can't say that we're doing it for no other reason. Pain, fifth vital sign. We know it doesn't work for long-term use. Let's see if we could buy our way in. So this whole beginning of the scale was corruption that goes into the government, the DEA, and the FDA. The FDA was formed for a reason. We had, I forget what her name was, but it was in the time of thalidomide. The FDA wasn't even, didn't even <coughs> exist. And they were trying to pass the drug in the United States, and she was like, I don't know, I don't trust this, like, give, you need to give me more information. We can't sell this in the United States because I just, I'm not comfortable enough with it. And she held out, held out, held out. These guys were throwing money around through the government, and they were going to her pissed off saying, what are you doing? This is a good drug. Why are you holding it back? She held out enough so that they saw that people were being born with deformities, and then she was hailed as the queen, and they formed this FDA cover to say, we really need to know about how these things work. So it grew and it grew with no money. And then they, here's the kicker. They decided if the drug company wants to put a drug through us for okay, we don't have enough infrastructure or funds to do it. If they pay for it, this research for us to look into it, mm. then it's, it'll work. That's how it works right now. So if, I want to, if I'm Purdue and I want to get OxyContin in, I hand over all the money to process it through the FDA. The FDA swells. Their job is reliant now upon the drug company's money to get these things to go through. <clears throat> That's right. How the heck is that okay? Mm -hmm. That's not a conflict of interest? Yes, it is. During the height of our problem, during the height of this thing, they were, the D, there was a DEA agent that said, Jesus, we're, I could see where it's breaking down. The manufacturers go to distributors. The distributors are supposed to report suspicious activity. They're not reporting it. Let's bust them. McKesson, Cardinal Health, these are the major companies that 
get the drugs. Uh, let, let, let me back it up. Let me explain how this happens. So the DEA says you're only allowed to make this many pills of opioids ever, period. That's all you, have, you can make. You say, okay, well, we make them. Then they take it and they give it to distribution companies. You've got Cardinal House, McKesson. If the number five wealthiest <laughs> companies in the country is McKesson, and they, all they do is distribute drugs. They're supposed to report suspicious activity if pharmacies and doctors and hospitals are ordering too much of this stuff. Why would they do that when there's billions with a B money being made? The pharmacies are supposed to report suspicious activity from medical doctors who are prescribing. Why would they do it when their pharmacies have a line out the door to do it? The system is completely broken. So during this whole time of how this was happening, and we're going, the, the deaths are increasing year to year in the guts and glory, like in 2011 to 2014, the DEA allowed the drug manufacturers to increase their production by 400%. During the height, the height of this, how is that possible? There's a revolving door in a system in government that takes place that there's 58 attorneys that work in the FDA and the DEA and the DOJ that are hired into the pharmaceutical companies to work. Everybody knows it. They line up and they wait. They're decision makers. They pro-decision to these companies and they wait for the time to come so they get hired out at 10 times the salary to make it in the government. 58 attorneys out of the Department of Justice and the DEA got hired into pharma over the same period of time that the death rates were spiking and they were getting nervous that there was going to be a halting process. You know the number one law enforcement agent in our country is this, you know, anybody? Attorney General. Two of these attorneys that got hired into pharma were the secretary, uh, the deputy attorney general. The second highest ranking person in our government's judicial Ooh. system that can go after law enforcement were hired into the system. Now, you could pick up that bat phone anytime you want to get laws changed. That's, not, that's how it goes. Just... Hanging down. <laughs> you want to help me? John Russo. <laughs> Technical difficulties. Yeah, help. You need help? Go. Good? Hey, my nephew. <laughs> Good look. Stand up, nephew. He <laughs> <laughs> still live in the area and came to see his uncle talk and make a fool of himself. <laughs> so one thing that happened that was cha game changing is Curtis Wright who worked for the FDA was bamboozled into this revolving door system and was told by Purdue and the Sacklers to say hey can we change or add some wording to our little white piece of paper that comes in the box to say that we could use this for chronic long-term use. And he said yes, they changed the label, and six months later, he's working for Purdue. Wow. wow. So we're 5% of the world. Was there supposed to be a video there? Back it up. Red button. So we're less than 5% of the world's population, mm -hmm. and we consume 90. There's 80 to 90 you heard earlier. Mike was saying it's 80 to 90%. 80% is the tag that they use on prescription <laughs> opioids. The other 10% is illicit. When you combine it, it's about 90%. So when I say illicit, I mean opioids is a big trail, but by the time you start taking medications and then lead into heroin and fentanyl-laced heroin, we're looking at 90% of all that's available is consumed by the United States. And let that sink in. What does that tell you? You know, it's not just a stat, it's a discussion. If we're less than 5% of the world's population and consume 90%, two things can be true. The rest of the world has no pain. I call <laughs> bull sugar on that. 
or we've been completely duped by a system that told us we're supposed to take the yes. medication. Reverend, you're not, you, this, we're talking the same game here. We've been, mm -hmm. This wool has pulled over our eyes completely. It's not okay that they have tech, the, the, the techniques and the things that are used for thousands of years. Now all of a sudden it's sexy to be us, right? We were quacks, everything. You guys are in the integrative medicine and mindfulness. Like, what the hell are you talking? You're going to mm your way out of pain? Well, yeah. <laughs> Guess what they do in other countries? They mm out of pain. <laughs> <laughs> in, China, in all the Asian countries, by the way, primary care is acupuncture and oriental medicine. The root cause of this epidemic is the FDA's illegal approval of opioids for the treatment of chronic pain. When the top-selling opioid, OxyContin, was first approved in 1995, it was based on science that only showed it safe and effective when used short-term. Today, the label says, the powerful pain pills are effective for daily, around-the-clock, long-term treatment. You're using high-dose, long-duration opioids when they've never been designed to do that. There's no evidence that they're effective. There's extreme evidence of harms and deaths when you use them. The FDA bowed to Purdue Pharma's demands to ignore the lack of scientific data and change the label to, quote, around the clock for an extended period of time. It was the decision of no return for the FDA. We found out that a group of experts and FDA and pharmaceutical companies were having private meetings. And at these meetings, changing the rules for how opioids get approved. It was a marketing tsunami. And the agency didn't catch it. Just a few weeks ago, the FDA approved a new opioid that is a thousand times more powerful than morphine. And this is in the middle of this opioid epidemic. How is that possible? You have a system of pharmaceutical promotion that changed the way medicine practiced, and no one right, stopped it. Mm. Yeah, that was supposed to be the tail end of that conversation that just pissed you. I want you pissed off. I'm pissed off. That's if right. You can't tell I'm yeah. emotional about this. Something's wrong with you. Go back up and take a shower in that sexy shower you got upstairs. <laughs> <laughs> because. <laughs> You need to, I, I'm trying to get you mad, you know, this 30, 70 percent. I'm going to go on to the 70 and talk about how we can do something together to make a difference. <laughs> but this 30, I want, I want you mad. I want you mad as hell because it's not okay. It's not fair. You know, I got into this because I saw the writing on the wall. I knew we had something that we could do that offer that was better and treat through pain instead of prescribing through pain. And it kills me what's happening. You have two issues on awareness. There's the fact that they're not aware that we, we exist, that we, we could have fixed this damn problem. Or it had it never started. And the other is these poor people who suffer, they're being mistreated because we stigmatize them to be these crazy people. They're not crazy, they, they have a problem. Kryptonite to this issue is to just love somebody. That's real kryptonite to this thing. If you walk by somebody in the throes of it in the city and their heads in the bushes and you walk by and you say, look what you're doing to yourself. That's a problem. My mission is to change that attitude and say, look what we did to you. What can I do to help you? Mm -hmm. If 80% of heroin users, we discussed this earlier, started heroin, coming off of a prescription opioid. That means that they had to start with that little damn white piece of paper in someone's <coughs> office. It's not your fault, by the way. I'm kind of like yelling at you. <laughs> it's, not, it's not your fault. It's not your fault. I'm going to yell anyway. <laughs> now, some of that is prescribed and used the right way, and addiction occurs. Some of it's prescribed and ends up sitting in a medicine cabinet and it gets diverted from kids taking it out of there and they go to a party. You know what's kind of a cool thing at high school right now is a pill party. They put it in a bowl. You take it from the house, they put it in a bowl, mm -hmm. mix it up, and you just go to the party and take what's in there. Mm -hmm. So if you, there's this, this thing that's happening that makes, makes it diverted to people who don't understand or maybe a little bit susceptible and they take it and they become addicted in that manner too. But 80% 
We were talking about it earlier. What's the number one reason for an opioid prescription? Back pain. Back pain. Back pain. What's the number one reason to see a doctor? Back pain. Back pain. What is the number one thing we do that's proven, tried, and true that we can fix without drugs or surgery? Back pain. Back pain. Hello, guys. Come on. This is an 80%. When, I, I'm, when I'm at the meetings at the White House and I'm shaking the cage and guys believe you me as being the only Cairo that's ever getting a seat at that table, they hate me. Sometimes. Sometimes they like me. Sometimes. It depends on who's in the room. But that 80% could be, you know, if we can get in, in the middle of some of that percentage, we could really make a dent in this. Now, we, you said earlier about the Vietnam War. I'm going to take it to another level, just to get people pissed a little bit more. All right. If you add up eight years in Vietnam, eight in Iraq, 16 in Afghanistan and counting, that's 32 years of war. Add up all the deaths that took place in 32 years. Every single year, we lose more people to an overdose than the combination of every one of those years. Doesn't that, I mean, is that, that's not, that's not a disgusting figure? <laughs> Now, I remember seeing films and even remember a little bit of the picketing and the craziness that would go, you're killing our children, sending them to war. They got, they, there was grassroots stuff going on like crazy about why are we doing it? I don't see, like... A thousand people a week dropping and we don't see that, that it's not sexy enough. There's still stigma associated with it. I'm going to show a handful of pictures. Now, I, you said this before, the number one cause of death. I know it's like it goes on a slide and it's a stat, it goes by quick, but take a deep breath and just think, say it in your own head right now. The leading cause of death for Americans under 50 years old is an opioid overdose. It's not cancer, it's not a car. I, when you see a car and it's surrounded in glass and they hit each other, we know there's ton, tons of love slamming into each other. You have a chance you're going to go, right? You know, cancer, all those disease processes that get you are usually in late stage in your life. But for 50 and younger, it's dying of this. Who's got the keys to the safe to fix this problem, guys? We do. We do. We do. That's yeah. right. This is some of you have seen me talk before. Some of it's new stuff and stats, and some is, um, is here again. I want you to see what this does to you. You think these people decided when they wake, woke up one morning, I want to in seven years look like this. I want to in seven years look like this. Wow. I want to in four years look like this. I want in one year to look like this. Wow. I want in a few months to look like this. This is the first arrest and the last arrest for heroin possession before they died of an overdose. They don't wake up and want to do that. That's not where they want to be. So after all those things I'm telling you about the corruption and the undertow, we've got to understand that it's not their fault. Like We put it in a position for them to get this thing. Like we're, Societally, we're just creating a bunch of zombies who then we say, well, that's not working, then what do you do when you medicate with psych drugs? What do you do to that poor soul who wants to be something and is so damn energetic he's beating himself off the walls, right? So let's tamper him down with something so he feels completely not like himself and then gets exposed to an opioid and says, well, that makes me feel like I don't care. And guess what the cycle of the next addiction becomes? Now, if you look at... You know, this slide, you're never going to see the little things on it. You're not meant to be. But peeling that onion and rolling it back, like, you've got to understand what the problems are in society, what happens, what takes place. There is two, two to three years in a row where we're losing life expectancy in this country for the first time since World War I. You said it earlier, Mike. So what happens between the miracle of birth and our life expectancy in a country going down, when they're saying the root cause is being over-medicated. There are a lot of things in the middle that happen there. This is not like one thing. They're, they're talking about how they're, I'm at meetings there and, and for prevention, and everybody around the table is talking about 486% increase in Narcan distribution. The number of deaths have just have stabled or slightly decreased in the hardest hit sections of the country. And I'm like, what? Wait, what? The next person goes, yeah, and our Narcan distribution was, the next person goes, it's like, well, now it's free because you could just go, you don't need a prescription. And we have, a, I'm like, what the hell is going on? 
By the time I spoke, I'm like, you guys are telling me it's okay to become addicted so long as we have the reversal drugs and some treatment centers. This is really great. You falsified the information of this problem. You're not doing a damn thing by distributing the Narcan except saving lives and not stopping them from getting to that point. Now, do we have to save lives? Don't think I'm coarse about this. You have to. And it's great that it's being distributed. But don't beat your damn chest in front of me because you didn't go upstream and stop prescribing medication. Excuse me, Reverend. You excuse. That's right. You excuse. <laughs> I've been playing drums since I was 10 years old. So when I broke my arm skateboarding, you could say I was pretty devastated. And my doctor suggested pills to ease the pain. I thought my problems were over. But really, they're just the beginning. The truth is, I was taking pills longer than I was supposed to. I was doing really stupid stuff to get more. Buying pills from kids, sneaking them from bathrooms at parties. I even stole pills from my grandmother's medicine cabinet. It was so easy to get them. They're everywhere. My story could be your story, or the story of someone you love. Pay attention. You could save someone's life. Take back your unused or expired prescription drugs before they end up lost, stolen, or misused. Visit DEATakeBack.com. Now, I showed that at the last, in April, the, the DEA tack, Take Back Day was the following day. And I told everybody in the room to take their phones out and send themselves a reminder that they were going to post that night before they went to bed to make sure that they got out to your groups, your, your connections, your network, to make sure you go into the medicine cabinet. And if you don't think that you can save a life by doing that, I'm telling you, you can. You want to help? Be part of the solution? I'm fighting every day. I'm going to do it anyway. I'm going to make sure that I got, and I got these band of soldiers with me. But if you personally want to make a difference, like right now, this national take back day in April had 937 pounds of drugs that were brought back. The total in 17 Ooh. campaigns is 11,816 pounds of drugs that were taken back. The last campaign was more than the weight of six Boeing 757s were collected. The entire campaign. Imagine 83 Boeing 757s, the weight of 83 of them were collected over these campaigns. You know when the next one is and happens to be? is Saturday, October 26th. Wow. So mark it in your calendars, put it on your social media feeds, put something out there to say, you're part of the team that's fighting the crisis, make sure you go in your medicine cabinets and throw the stuff you don't use away. Don't be that person who takes it and says, I don't like how I feel, but this is really strong. It's really good. You never know when I might get, like, jump the fence and get my leg caught and rip it open next week or fall off the roof when I'm trying to clean the gutter. So you put it in the corner, and then six months later, you forgot you even had it. And I guarantee there's people in this room that it's sitting in the back of your cabinet. Mm -hmm. Get rid of it. Mm -hmm. So what am I doing? So I'm telling you what you could do. Now I want to lean into some of the stuff I'm doing to give some hope to this thing. So here we go into the 70%. I'm shaking a cage here and there. I, I'm, when you are with the Secretary of State, the drug czar, James Carroll, Speaker of the House, Congressman, Senators, Manchin from uh, West Virginia, Pascrell from New Jersey, um, you get a chance to shake the cage a little bit. You get a chance to plant seeds, you get a chance to say something. I think it's more of me saying how great I am, because I don't know how much they listen. I don't know how much, it's grassroots stuff that goes. One guy that's in there, I'm sneaking under the radar because I get a chance to hang out with them, but do they really gonna, are they really going to do what I say? Or am I there as a surrogate so that they can say, I talked to 140 surrogates about the crisis, but we're still doing all these things. But we cleared it with them. It only works when you got these troops. When all of us are showing up every single day and saying the same message, that's when you're going to get this heard. But then when I come out and they're mad at me, I make sure I, got, I stay close to the Secret Service agents. <laughs> <laughs> Nephew, you recognize that guy? <laughs> Antonio. Antonio Marigliano. His grandfather was head mason for the White House. His father was 
head of the garden area, and of course he gets in a secret service, and he looks like Jack, that guy come across the lawn, you don't want to do anything if you're over there, and then they let that dog with the muzzle out, forget it. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty scary. So some late, uh, latest updates. Did I yeah. miss yep. one? Yeah. Back one. Back one? Mm -hmm. I don't get the back button to go. Don't laser me. There you go. Look, Angelo! There you are, sitting at the table. <laughs> so because of the things that we do, we get a call and say, well, we're, you, you get that phone call and it's like the Homeland Security. It's, no, it says United States of America and I'm eating dinner. I'm like, I'm getting scammed from the United States. Like, what happened to the scam likely button, right? So my, and I'm like, I'm, get it if you have to answer. I'm like, I'm not going to answer. Like, who knows? It's the United States of America. She goes, you're, you're on the pen. Like, my wife's like, what are you, you know, answer the damn phone. <laughs> so I answer. It's like, this is something I'm saying, Homeland Security. I'm like, can you see me right now? <laughs> what am I eating? <laughs> um, they need a medical panel put together. Angelo and I talked at, um, at a convention, and we had the head of postal at JFK, who was phenomenal in describing a lot of what happens with fentanyl as it comes in. JFK actually brings in 70% of all mail packages from other countries through their facilities. They have like x-ray and laser technology and dogs and stuff that they try to detect how this stuff comes in. But now when these things pop up, They'll, the bat phone rings, call, get some people together. And, um, Angelo gave his expertise on the um, emergency medicine and medicine in general. I did some of the integrative piece. And then the guy to the other side is a scientist to talk about what addiction looks like. Um, but these are the things that I'm doing, so I want you to know. But now up to, some of the up-to-date information, the, the second billion dollar package or installment for national health care crisis did go through so we're in number two phase now and just clear because some people politically there was that uh, the noise of like they didn't make it a, 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 a national emergency he went and did a national health crisis national emergency has billions of dollars in the bank but the national health crisis had forty three dollars so there was a big political I'm independent by the way I'm not pro you uh, I can't stand the far one side and the other because they're the cause of a lot of problems. So, but, but in this case, when you pick up the bat phone, do you want FEMA answering and saying, got trailers? We've got a lot of addiction going on. You know, it's not made as an emer a, a, a state of emergency. It's the national, it's national health crisis. Then it becomes appropriated. So you don't have funds that you use. You have funds that get appropriated. So, so far we had two cycles of $6 billion. That's pretty good. The death rates have flattened out in the past 12 months, but I told you earlier that flattening is a little bit falsified information because there's so much more Narcan distributed on the street. There's Narcan buddies, like people who are users now hold Narcan. They, the partner uses and they wait to see the reaction. And if something goes wrong, they'll give it to them. And if nothing goes wrong, they use. So it's almost crutching so that they don't pass from this thing. And then they're getting hit with it. I have family members who are you know, in the fire department. Fire department, 76% of New York City and the Bronx calls to the fire department are to administer Narcan for an overdose, not for fires. Mm-hmm. Oh, my God. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right, Reverend? Mm -hmm. Is that fair? Yeah. It's, not, it, it, it's crazy. That's right. That's right. That's the increase in knocks on dispensing. Truth Initiative Ad Council. I talked about this before, and I was so mad about this marker. Because I had said, how many of you have seen the truth, the anti-opioid commercials on TV? Two, three, four, six, a room of 300, so. maybe so. more. They're saying that at one of the meetings, they had 1.4 billion views. If no one, I don't, I don't remember, I know I have to see it because I'm on the damn call when they were showing it. That's another story. But with, then I checked, they're using Nielsen ratings for when they put it on the TV of how many people were watching that program during the time. And nobody, they, no one even knows, like that's when you get up to go to the bathroom or have a, pick up another cupcake. Because <laughs> no every time I ask in rooms of 1,000, 10,000, even a stadium of 20,000, I did a, a talk. Nobody has a clue that they've seen it. 
But I'll tell you what they did. I was on that call. I'm like, I, I get a code that I could punch in to give your opinion. I punch it in. I'm like, oh, my God. I'm not, I'm like, and I grab this house phone, and I call again and punch it in there. I'm like, poor, give me your cell phone. Like, Dial this number. Because I was so mad at what they were putting through. They had this girl. One of the commercials is a girl sitting in a car staring at a building. And there's like a voiceover of how she can't get her prescription anymore and hits the gas pedal and drives into the building. Mm-hmm. Right. I just saw you shake your head. Like, that's crazy. So you now, societally, we just looked at that person and said, she's crazy. That's not fair. You just bumped stigma up another notch. It's not right. The VA, though, I'll tell you, they're the most implicit in causing this problem at the time based on a, a subset of the population because they polymedicate the daylights out of people. I'm sure you can attest to seeing com- comrades that have come back and had issues and they get psych drugs right away. Then they're given pain medication on top of it, both of which dope you down. Go have a drink with the boys. And then they say the person committed suicide. Mm-hmm. John McCain got a whistleblower note through, um, through mm-hmm. s- the VA saying, take a look at the medications and determine whether 22 suicides a day in the VA system are actually suicides. And they, that's not even out yet. You haven't even heard it. Um, it should be out in the first quarter because they're doing some other tidied up work with it. But if you have a, a diagnosis of post-traumatic st- stress disorder with suicidal tendencies, and that's the first diagnosis in the folder, when they go in and get these guys that were polymedicated, you see a bottle of Jack, you see cigarettes, you see the bottle of drugs, and that those are all suppressants. So the brain stem gets overstimulated with these opioid receptors, and guess how you die of an overdose? Your, your, your guts don't fall out. The brain stem says, okay, let's go to sleep. You just stop breathing. So suicide or murder? Tell me. Mm-hmm. Homeland Security sees 5,000 pounds of fentanyl in 2018 alone. That's a lethal dose to kill every American four times. And that's what they seized. You have no idea. When we were at that lecture with, uh, what's his name, Frank? Frank something, I forget. But he was scaring the daylights out of me. I, they, I stayed through the whole thing. You, I think, had to go after we did the talk. And I was like, this was the worst thing I ever did. I'm sitting here with the Department of Justice, the DEA, and all the police officers, and they're talking about all this nasty stuff. But like pens. You got pens on your chairs. There's pens in your room. Those things, there's 13,000 boxes a day or something like that that come through the, um, at, at uh, Kennedy Airport. And two of them, instead of having ink, it's filled with fentanyl. But you can't figure, like how many of those, you don't open up 13,000 boxes. So this stuff's just flooding into the system through the border and through the postal system. It's almost impossible to control it. You just talked to me about this yesterday, Mike. said, they're all saying how it's evening and off, leveling off. We're seeing better numbers. This was September 29th. It was the largest number of deaths in one day in Ohio. And it beat the previous one, which was like a month earlier. Right. You tell me it's getting better? So here's where we now start to bubble up some things that we can do because all of a sudden, like I said before, now we're sexy. Like you go in to speak to a medical doctor who's a primary care physician and talk about integrative medicine, their ears perk up where before it was like, get out of here. Now all of a sudden the studies that are coming through, they're taking a peek at this. This is a British Medical Journal. This is done September 2nd. It is saying that a retrospective cohort study of patients with new onset of low back pain from 08 to 13, they went back and took all the coding material, because now codes and electronic health records, we're a pain in the ass. We lose so much time having to do with this crap. But the, the only side effect that's really good is you can actually press a button and you get statistical data back. Well, they ran this, and the conclusion was initial visits to a chiropractor or physical therapist associated with substantially decreased early and long-term use of opioids. Woo! We've been saying that shit for a long time, people. Now, all of a sudden, they want to go back and prove it for us? Go right ahead. Have at it. 
Another one. This is, this is September 27th. It's not too, we're only talking a couple of weeks ago. This just came out. Objective of the study from Yale School of Medicine. Investigate the current evidence to determine if there's an association between chiro chiropractic use and opioid receipt. The review demonstrates an inverse association between chiropractic use and opioid receipt among patients with spinal pain. We know, we've been talking, we've been, but now they're doing it. They're starting to put, because now they have to. Every reg that comes out, it says integrative medicine in parentheses. I think it was written once and they all stole it because it's the same thing in each one. The FDA has it, the government has it, and Joint Commission has it. Um, like you can't write that script unless you talk to them or refer them to these things. Physical therapy, chiropractic, acupuncture, behavioral medicine. So now everybody's starting to churn it. So I sent those things over to somebody that I know over there because I'm the guy who does that and says, hey, you know, just some more mm -hmm. proof for the pudding. He's like, hey, did you respond to the CMS, you know, thing for Medicare Medicaid on looking for information? And I poo-pooed it off because how many of you know that we're in the battle trying to get, like, congressmen and senators to sign off on the Medicare thing? If you don't know, I mean, you don't look at email, I can't imagine that that's not part of what you see. Now, I thought that's what they were talking about. They dropped this thing quietly and asked the public to give their opinion on medically assisted treatment and alternative treatments for pain. So that, and look at the date that it's due. Guess when my send button was pressed? This morning before I came down here. So they only gave me a few days, but they do it purposely, quietly let this out this is, this is the government. You know how mad I was to say, like, why didn't somebody call and say, hey, John, you're part of the action here. This is going to drop. Why don't you get your tip? They don't care. Hmm. I called every college, every state association, CMS. two or three organizations, the Foundation for Chiropractic Progress. We have so much crap that was sent in. As of this morning, my email box was full. Woo! Yeah, yeah. So like I said earlier, this is a Kaiser Foundation study, and they said, they put it, this was a pretty large study too, it was done in 16. Who's responsible for the opioid crisis?